Dr. Nigel Lester is a research scientist in the science and research branch of the Ministry of Natural Resources. He is also an adjunct professor at the University of Toronto. Dr. Lester obtained a Bachelor of Arts and Master of Science degrees from Queen's University and then obtained his PhD from the University of Sussex in England. Dr. Lester, Dr. Lester began his career with the MNR in 1982. He worked as a biologist with fisheries assessment units and coordinated the development of software for managing Ontario's fisheries information. Dr. Lester joined the research branch in 1992 as a research scientist. He has researched the effects of climate and other environmental variables on the growth, reproduction, and longevity of freshwater fish. Dr. Lester's research over the years has made significant and valuable contributions to freshwater fisheries management in Ontario. Everyone here knows the value of monitoring and assessment for sound fish and wildlife conservation management. In recent years, Dr. Lester has led the development of MNR's broad scale monitoring program. It is for this reason that we felt it was fitting to invite Dr. Lester here today to share some of the highlights of broad scale monitoring with you. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Nigel Lester to the stage. Thank you, Matt, for that uh, introduction. I'm truly uh, very, very happy to be here today and thank the uh, OFAH for inviting me. Um, I want to tell you what I think about what I think is a, an exciting new program, uh, but of course new is just a relative term. It depends how long you've been around as to what's new. Um, Matt neglected to mention that I've also been around MNR for, for quite a while, 30 years, so this program looks new to me. Uh, it's not new to everybody in MNR, uh, but uh, that's the way it goes. Uh, there's a lot of other people who could have given you this talk, but I'm, I'm certainly glad to be here. I'll give you a, a touch of the history since I have been around since this program was just an idea. And I'll, but more importantly, I want to tell you about the important role it plays in management of our inland fisheries. <clears throat> so if you like fishing, or if you just like the tranquility of our lakes and rivers, Ontario's clearly the place to be. We have a very rich landscape. When you look at this landscape, you can detect some relatively large lakes on the landscape, and these lakes are monitored quite intensively by the Ministry of Natural Resources. I don't want to look at those today. What I want to look at is what about the rest of the resource on this landscape? Individually, there's a lot of small lakes out there, but as a group, it amounts to a vast resource. And the question is, what are we doing to manage that resource? Let's have a look at that resource. Well, if it's largemouth bass you're interested in, you better stick to the southern part of the province. If it's musky, also for the most part, a southern fringe. Northern pike, you can get them everywhere. Brook trout, more restricted range. Smallmouth bass, southern species, but it's moving northward. Lake trout, if it's deep enough for those cold waters in the summer, the lake may have lake trout in it, widely distributed. And of course, walleye, the preferred fish in our province from a recreational fishing viewpoint, Glad to say we've got over 4,000 of those lakes and they're widely dispersed across the province. That picture is a picture of a vast, spectacular resource and we are lucky to be here. The picture you're seeing is there because of the work that some young people did back in the 70s and 80s when the aquatic habitat inventory was conducted. And I think there's some people who are on that survey in the room, I met at least two of them last night here. Uh, that survey surveyed 10,000 lakes, collected bathymetry, water chemistry, and species lists. It's a vast information source for all of us scientists working on the province. It's, we have not been back to do a province-wide survey until very recently. In 1980, or sorry, in 2008, we initiated the broad-scale monitoring program. The first cycle of that program was completed in 2012, 
and we, su we surveyed 700 lakes across the province, and this map shows you where they are. We collected bathymetry, water chemistry, and did the species listing again, but we also collected much more. I want to tell you about what that much more is, but first, just how did this program begin? Well, it's, it's probably at least over a decade ago where we started re-asking this question, how do you manage this spectacular resource? There's tons of challenges here. We got many lakes and species, at least 10,000 lakes, larger than 50 hectares. We got multiple target species. We got multiple stresses on this system, habitat changes, community changes, fishing. We have multiple goals, healthy ecosystems, sustainable fishing, social and economic benefits. So there's challenges, but we believe there are solutions. Solutions being, for many lakes and species, we can't monitor every lake, but we can take a statistical sampling approach and look at them. Multiple stresses, they're simultaneous and cumulative effects, so we need to monitor the ecosystems, look at the communities, look at the environment. And the multiple goals, well, these goals are overlapping, so the data needs for evaluating our success and achieving them may well be overlapping as well. So this type of thinking led to a shift in emphasis. Uh, in 2005, we developed something which we then called the new ecological framework for fisheries management. The idea of this program was when we look at this map, we can't simply ask how is my lake doing because there's too many of them. We need to kind of reorganize and think, how is my zone doing? So we, this particular emphasis created a new map for the province, a map of fisheries management zones, and it created an emphasis that our monitoring program should be focused on telling us what's the status of systems within these zones. It also created another set of, a series of components of that program. The components were number one, set our goals for zones, not individual lakes. Number two was enhanced public involvement. Uh, we, we led to the creation of advisory councils on each zone. I'll tell you more about them. Uh, it led to the concept we have to monitor the zones, not just focus on, a, on individual lakes, and, and this led to something called the Inland Lakes Broad Scale Monitoring Program. And then lastly, it led to something, a, a five-year management cycle, so that there's a expected time frame for reporting back and making decisions in managing this resource. What does that management cycle look like? It's no different than any management cycle for any individual fisheries. The only difference is we apply this management cycle at the zone level. The components of that cycle are, first of all, we are setting goals and objectives. How do we do this? This is, is all documented through creation of a management zone plan where MNR plus advisory councils work together. Essentially, that plan talks about what's the desired state of resources and what are the indicators we need to monitor to know if we're there. Second component is the broad scale monitoring program. If we know, to know if we're there or not, we need to sample the, the landscape. We need to sample the zone. It involves selection of lakes, collection of data, reporting. I'll tell you about those three components. Of course, the last thing is taking the reports from that monitoring and doing the review of the zone. MNR plus advisory councils get together, evaluate are the objectives met, and what actions are needed to meet objectives, or are we okay, we just stay the course. So those are the three steps in the process. I want to go into some more detail here. Let's start at the top with goals and objectives. So the first start in this is to actually create advisory councils in each zone. They're not created in all zones, but a number of zones are, are, are created. Um, these involve local citizens with an interest in, in resources uh, of, of the area um, and involves meetings uh, with biologists. Uh, and those biologists bring some of what we call our sort of provincial guiding principles to the process that we're looking for plans here that recognize sustainable fishing healthy ecosystems, socioeconomic value, cultural value, recognize the diverse landscape and the diversity of people and interests on that landscape. So this involves a fair amount of study 
And basically that study is usually a map exercise. So if we take fisheries management zone five as an example, up in the northwest part of the province, spanning from Atacoke into uh, Kenora, Dryden, Fort Francis area, this is what the map of the zone looks like. I'm just gonna show you some of the things you need to look at at the zone to think about how to do the planning. First of all, where's the cool water fisheries? Where are the walleye and the pike? So one needs to map out those, those lakes. Where are the cold water fisheries? Where are the lake trout? Of course, along the way, we also look at the warm water fisheries and, and look at the distribution of bass, for example, on that landscape. Surficial geology helps us to understand variation in fish production across that landscape. Climate helps us understand production as well. Fish grow faster in, when the seasons are longer. Road density helps us understand access to lakes and potential impacts of fishing and other stresses resulting from human contact on, on lakes. So when you put all this together, uh, you basically come out at the end with some type of fisheries management zone plan. And those plans, if you look at the different zones, essentially say what's the desired state of the resource? The desired state of the resource essentially focuses on the target species that we are interested in, the ones that provide us with fishing opportunities, both consumption and trophy. So we're interested in the abundance and size of those fish in those lakes and rivers in those zones. Of course, if we're looking at desired state of the resource, we need to understand factors that may be affecting that desired state. Habitat's extremely important. We need to understand temperature, oxygen, water clarity, phosphorus, lots of different water chemistry and stuff like pH and calcium, um, long list of stuff. Community, we heard yesterday about invasive species on the, uh, on, on the system, it's a, it's a big, big issue. Uh, we need to understand the community, basically, first of all, in terms of the forage fish that's provided and the, and the zooplankton, the trophic base of the system, the benthos and invasive species as well are potential disruptors in that whole thing. And then finally, fishing. Uh, we need to understand how much fishing effort is going on. It's a good thing, provides opportunities, it's what we want, that's the economic base. We also need to understand the impact of that in that fishing when we're thinking in terms of creating a sustainable fishing opportunities over time. When we put it all together, what we're saying is we need to monitor the ecosystem, not just the harvested species. That's what will help us understand where we sit today and how things will change in the future. So this type of thinking in the plans is what directs the monitoring program that goes on. The monitoring program essentially has three things to do, select some lakes, collect some data, and then report. So how does the lake selection work? Let's go back to zone five. Here we've got a big zone full of lakes. What happened? We selected 130 lakes in that zone for the monitoring program. We basically divided the lakes into small, medium, large, and extra large, and then we took a random set of lakes from each of those size categories. When you look at the map, it's pretty good. We do a pretty good job of covering across the whole zone. If we look at that at a provincial perspective, here's zone five in the bottom corner here, but you can see that the points on the rest of the map are also reasonably dense, still a small fraction of what's there on the landscape, but they're well scattered across the landscape and they're well distributed in terms of looking at different sizes of, of systems and different species in the system. So when I put a map up like that, no doubt a lot of people, most people, look at that map and the first question they say is, was my lake picked? We all have a favorite lake out there and we kind of like to know if it's on that map. Well, I'll give you two hints. First of all, if your lake is big, it's probably got a if your favorite lake's big, it's got a pretty good chance of being there. Mm -hmm. This chart shows that the extra large lakes, being larger than 5,000 hectares, across the province, we sample about 60 of those. But in fact, that actually represents a huge proportion of that size category, somewhere in the order of 75% of those large lakes are sampled. So if your lake's big, maybe you got a 75% chance. If your lake's small, forget it. That small category here, we've got a lot of lakes there, well over 200, but that represents about maybe 3% of what's out there. So that's how the game works. Now, if you want to know if your lake's there or not, go to the web. 
check the web. Fish Online, wonderful source of information. In addition to telling lots of other things of information, it will tell you whether that lake's had a broad scale monitoring survey done on it. And if it has, it'll give you this lovely little printout that gives you basically some, just some basic information saying the survey was done um, and here's, here's some introductory information of what was seen. So now, if you go and your leg's not there, don't give up hope. I'll tell you, basically in the next cycle, we select new lakes, some additional new lakes, so there's still a chance. But before we move on, I just want to mention that this particular lake is from Kashwakamak Lake, and that happens to be my lake. I've got a cottage on that lake. But I just wanted to assure you, I had nothing to do with the random pick of this lake in the system. It's just pure chance. It's a medium-sized lake, but that's the way the numbers work. That's the lottery system. Good luck. Let's move on. So here we are, at the end of cycle one. We sampled about 700 lakes. We're going to start, we have started cycle two already. We're sampling about 525 of those lakes again, the same lakes. In addition, we're sampling a new set of lakes. So the little growing pink box at the top is the additional random sample of lakes that gets picked up in each cycle. That's the part that if your lake hasn't been picked up already, there's still a chance that it'll end up in that little part. The way the program works is we keep sampling a common set of lakes because we better detect the change over time, but we keep expanding the sample by selecting additional random set of lakes through time so we see more lakes over time. So it's a trade-off between understanding, be, be, between detecting change and describing what the state of the resource is on that landscape. So that's the lake selection. What about the collection of data? What data are collected on each lake? Well, habitat, we want bathymetry, temperature, oxygen, water clarity, water chemistry. So we generate these maps, bathymetry maps, pretty colors. We collect oxygen, temperature profiles, and uh, a lot of uh, water chemistry information. What about the fish? Well, we look at the community as a whole. Uh, we look at zooplankton, we look at small fish. We also look at the harvested fish, the target species, particularly interested in the abundance, the size, age composition, and of course contaminants to understand whether they're healthy to eat or not. We pass that information to, to MOE. For doing the fish, we're using a, a gill netting methodology. Here's a map showing selection of sample sites in a, in a lake. We sample all depths because we're interested in all species. Number of sites varies depending on the lake area. For small fish, we use a small mesh net, catch a small fish, the net's about 12 meters long. And for the large fish, we use a larger mesh net, catching larger fish, and it's what's called the North American Standard, a net that's been proposed as a standard across all of North America. The great value being the information we collect is comparable beyond the province. Uh, and that net length is, is 25 meters. The other thing we collect is information on fishing. We want to understand act angling activity on these lakes. So we do flyover surveys, and we count angling parties on the lake, on these lakes. We do those counts uh, on, um, in the summer or the open water season, as well as the winter, to get a direct uh, indication of what type of activity is on the lake. So that's what we collect. What do the data look like? Well, walleye is the number one preferred species, so I thought I'd show you a little bit of walleye data, um, just to give a feel for the data, and then we'll talk more about generally how we try to report this stuff. So if you look at walleye, and take all the lakes in the province, this graph here shows what we call the catch per unit effort in kilograms per net. So the, the number of kilograms of walleye caught per net. And what the, the shape shows is that little uh, box there shows that 90% of the lakes caught something less than between zero and five kilograms per net. There's a few lakes, one in particular that caught nine kilograms per net. I don't have to know which lake that was, but I do have a database handy. <laughs> but I just wanted to give you a feel for that's what we're collecting. We use this information as an index of abundance. We also calibrate this information through separate studies so we can turn that number into the number of kilograms per hectare. 
Uh, and we're making good progress at doing that. We're working with people across Canada to understand how this methodology can be used, not just to get an index of abundance, but to get a measure of the actual density or number of fish in the lake. This is the great advantage of using what we call a North American standard because it's a standard that's starting to be adopted now beyond Ontario. So we're not alone in this game. Anyway, that's what the range of abundance is for walleye and it leaves one asking the question, why? Why is it so variable? Why do we have very little catches in some and high catches in others? Well, the factors affecting walleye abundance, one of the big things is water clarity. I'm sure anglers know pretty well. I, I had to study a lot of data to really understand this stuff, but, but if you've been on lakes, you probably understand walleye are, are uh, adapted to dim, dim light or whatever, and so you tend to see, as this graph shows, each point here is a lake, you tend to see that the higher catches, the higher abundance of walleye is on the low Secchi lakes. As water clarity increases, uh, the, the maximum catch rates are lower. You do also notice that some of those low Secchi systems have pretty low catches of walleye as well. So there's other factors affecting, it's not just water clarity. One of those factors, of course, is fishing. We take the same lakes and plot them versus our estimates of annual mortality the proportion or the percentage of the population that dies every year, we see a similar kind of shape that low mortality has, you can get high uh, catches or high abundance of walleye, but you don't see high abundance when the mortality is high. It's no surprise when we actually look at the, what we expect in these systems, low mortality, th those low values are close to what we expect for a natural mortality in the system. So when we see these high mortality rates, it's an indication that the system is probably being, being fished and the fishing is having an impact on the abundance. So it's this combination of different factors, habitat and fishing, if you like, that leads to the results that we see when we look at the abundance of fish in lakes. So that's, that's my walleye example. Uh, it's all the data I'm going to, going to show, but I hope it gives you a flavor for the types of things we can look at. This is an extremely rich data set. We have the same data types of data from every zone in the province. This has never been done before. In fact, I think not just in Ontario, but in, in terms of the, the detail of data we have, it's never been, been done before, but I think elsewhere you'd find that this is unique. It's a big job here in terms of pulling all this stuff together. I'm involved with a team of biologists that are doing it, but the concept is we, we have a whole list of reporting products and we are producing the same product that's produced in every zone in the, pro in the province. So there's a really nice comparable set of information for saying what do things look like in different zones and of course that's a stepping stone for saying and how do they change over time. So given we finished one cycle in the program, we're into our management zone review and essentially the results that come, the types of things I'm showing you here, are fed back to the advisory councils, uh, work with m and and the question we're asking is, are objectives met? And if not, what are the actions needed? So how do we look at these objectives? We take things like the abundance of walleye. It's not one value, it's many values. So this little box here sort of spans, if you like, the idea that it's a, there's a range, and we plot it for 2000, end of cycle one here, here's the results for walleye, how did we do? We can't really measure how we did unless we have some reference line. So let's say we had a plan whose desired state was that this is what we thought the abundance could be, and in this case, we're above that desired state, so everything's good. But what if our walleye abundance wasn't as high? We're kind of straddling the line here, we're kind of in that yellow caution zone. We're not quite where we hope to be. And what if the walleye abundance is low? We're well below where we hope to be. And we're left with the question is, well, if this desired state is a realistic state, how can we get back into that desired state? Essentially, what do we need to do to move the system back into that desired zone, desired state? Well we've got to sit down and decide what management actions are needed. So when we look at this template here about what affects fish populations, we've got to look at the habitat and say, is there, are there habitat issues? Is there habitat rehabilitation needed? We have to look at the community and say, do we have some type of issues in the community? 
that may be preventing realization of this goal. Um, community changes are hard to do, so what types of actions we have available to us for community change are probably relatively few. Uh, basically, we know that we want to kind of prevent and control species movement so we're not creating these species, these, these community changes, which create havoc for our, for our fisheries. And then, of course, with the fishing component, we need to understand both the fishing and the fishing impact to know whether some types of changes in fishing regulations are needed, uh, whether we need to do some strategic stocking, where, which like put, grow, and take stocking, which provides fishing opportunities in one place that takes fishing pressure away from another place, balances that stuff out, or whether there's uh, particularly educational things, things, uh, practice, uh, things that can do to help the success of catch and release type thing, making sure people understand what's the effective way of, of releasing fish. So those are the types of options. We also have, if, the, if, if we have a, a, a direct measurement, a, a direct effect would, on a population would be some type of rehabilitative stocking where we've seen that the population has suffered in the past through some habitat stress or other. We fix that problem, we need to rebuild the population. So those are our set of options, if you like. Uh, and there, there, there are others, but this gets you the general flavor. And the question is, if we choose one of them, did it work? Choosing the option is not the end of the exercise. It's a whole part of a cycle. So this cycle, we say we choose the action. We have a five-year cycle here. Basically, the monitoring continues. It's not over when we make the decision. Did the decision work? This is what we call the adaptive management cycle, where we actually follow up on the changes that were made. So the program is now in cycle two. We will shortly have reporting out for the first cycle, and then 2017, we'll finish the cycle two, and a year later, have reporting out from that particular cycle. And the, the cycle repeats. And it repeats itself again and again. If we get into this exercise, we recognize that this is an ongoing exercise. We're not planning to be there for the short time. We may adapt our programs a little bit over time, but we're buying in here. We're buying into something very, very big and very important. So in summary, what's this program doing? Well, the monitoring program collects data from a sample of lakes in each zone. It's conducted on a five-year cycle. And at the end of each cycle, it reports the status and trends of target species. It reports the status and trends of factors affecting target species. And it makes decisions about management action. So if we ask this question, how do you manage this spectacular resource, there can really only be one answer. And, and that's responsibly. I think we are on the track of responsible management here. One, we recognize its value economically, socially, culturally. This is unique value in the world. We're not just talking about the province here. We're talking about a very, very special place with opportunities to learn about ecosystems that don't exist in a lot of the more heavily trafficked parts of the world. So we have a responsibility here to manage and learn. We need to recognize the threats. We have habitat things. That we, habitat's important. We know we need to protect it. Community's important. We know we need to protect it. And of course, we have to look out for overfishing. Of course, climate is a special concern. And every management plan identified climate as a special concern. Whereas other factors, we look to reverse the world and try to get things back to a different state. Climate change is maybe one of those things when we're on a rolling train and we got to ride with it. Now, in our province, we know a lot about climate change because we see it whenever we drive north. If you look at a growing degree day map of the province, it's cold in the north, it's warm in the south, or warmer. We've learned a lot about that climate from the data we've collected across that climate range. We understand that fish grow slower in the north, and slower growth means less energy for reproduction, and less reproduction means annually less new fish in the system. And all of that adds up to saying that we can harvest less in the north than we can in the south. 
we're good for that. We understand it, and we can have the models to manage our fisheries with that. But what about the other climate change, the one that's happening through time? This map just tries to give an illustration of how our province has warmed over the last 30 years, so that we've moved here now to having, in most parts of the province, the systems are warmer. This is the real tricky type of climate change because you're dealing with lakes that are trying to adapt, lakes and their ecosystems that are adapting to a new climate system. It's not just about changes in fish productivity, it's changes in competitive advantage of different species. The shifts from the advantage from the cool water, cold water towards the warm water species. And this is the biggest challenge that we will probably face in the upcoming decades. And we clearly need to be prepared for it and understand that there's systems here where we may be beyond our control, but we certainly need to know how to adapt in terms of maintaining sustainable fisheries in the face of that climate change. So to wrap up, I just wanted to point out that I think we're onto a very good thing here. Um, the program that's being, that's proposed, the program that is in action happening on the landscape is consistent with guidelines for responsible fisheries put out by the, the, the Fisheries and Agriculture Organization worldwide. So this is part of the worldwide recommendation here for responsible fisheries. And when you look at what they ask you to do, it says, first of all, take an ecosystem approach, which addresses the key social, ecological feedbacks and promotes system sustainability. We're doing that. We're looking at people. We're looking at, at biology or ecology here, trying to understand that business of how we interact with our, our systems. Within that ecosystem approach, it says, take a precautionary approach. Acknowledge environmental risks to prevent irreversible harm to ecosystems and stocks. We are doing that. The biggest factor probably is the climate change thing and the understanding of how we can move forward with it and our need for data to understand how to move forward with that change. There's other examples too that I, I think would demonstrate the whole precautionary approach. The management process should be explicit in objectives, open, inclusive, and encompassing of all stakeholder desires. We are attempting to do that for the enhanced sort of public engagement in the whole thing. The whole point is to bring people more into the process of fisheries management so we have a successful formula on the landscape. And then one more component is the whole adaptive management component. It's learning through monitoring of the management interventions. So the program's not done when we make a decision, it's just part of the cycle. So with that, I just want to end and say, I think Ontario has a uh, good story to tell here. Um, this is proactive fisheries management, involves public engagement, involves investment in monitoring, decisions based on data, and an adaptive management cycle. And these are key. There's lots of interest in Ontario's approach to managing inland fisheries. Uh, I've been invited to the American Fisheries Society to talk about this programming this summer and also to the World Recreational Fisheries Conference uh, this fall in, in Brazil. And I think we're on to a good thing here. I think we've got still lots to learn. And I just want to say in the, where we've been so far, we've had good support from the public and LFH in particular for, for moving this program forward and when we appreciate that continued support. Thank you very much. So same drill as before, but I did want to say one thing. Uh, I think Nigel did a great job of uh, sharing this information, some insight on, into this program. And I think it's important for us to remember uh, as, as anglers that uh, monitoring is critically important, and Nigel showed that this morning. Uh, but even more so that this is something that our SPA, our special purpose account dollars, are paying for. Uh, it's criti critically important for managing the fishery. We need it, and as Nigel said in his last slide, that we need to invest in it. And, and it's an important investment for us as anglers to manage the fishery that we love. All right, so we'll take some questions here. Neil Weens from Northwestern Ontario. 
question uh, with regard to the monitoring system. You focused on broad scale monitoring of lakes and I sense there is either uh, missing from the whole program is monitoring of riverine systems. And I'm wondering what you feel uh, might be done to get some monitoring uh, in those uh, ecosystems themselves because they are certainly quite different from lakes. Yes, thank you, Neil. Uh, that's a great question and that it, it, it is an important gap in the system here. Uh, this this uh, program was initially uh, um, driven um, uh, primarily from fisheries and, and uh, lakes as a whole uh, support a larger amount of fishing than the rivers, so it's sort of very lake-centric in that perspective. But it's recognized um, by the ministry uh, that we need to now move forward and say, okay, this is, seems to be a pretty good concept here, but how can we incorporate rivers into that whole, whole business? So that's, a, um, that's an action item. It's, it's on the cards, and uh, we hope to see some progress. Thank you. Jack Doherty from uh, Olin Sound, Oops. and I'm on this one. <laughs> and I can attest to uh, the Great Lakes warming because I live on the shore of Georgian Bay, and, and last year I was able to get into the water at the end of August, which is really unusual because it's getting so much warmer. <laughs> Anyhow, question for you. What are you going to do about the natives and the disregard they have for looking after the species of fish in their area when they can overfish a lake with compunction and not even worry about it. What happens in your areas when you're trying to manage and they get in there and start netting and screw up your statistics? Yeah, it's always a... <laughs> hey, you're asking a scientist here. Yeah. <laughs> That's what you are, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the, whole, the whole business of... Uh, of uh, the harvesting of the system is is obviously a, a, tr a tricky business. The emphasis that we're doing here in terms of the uh, understanding the state of the resource is that we need to understand the state of the resource regardless of what's actually driving changes in that state of the resource. So the program itself, from a monitoring perspective, um, uh, basically is able to track changes in the fish populations over time and understand the stresses that are on the system. The management solutions in terms of, of the, uh, the greater control of the harvest or something is, is another, another question. And I, quite honestly, we don't have all the, the solutions to those problems right now, or at least I'm not aware of them coming from where I am. Uh, I think it's something when we just have to continue working together and try to build a more an inclusive approach to the resource. Sorry. Just thought I'd ask. Okay. Sorry. Alan Fennell. I'm Secretary Treasurer of Ontario Federation of Anglers Zone E. I'm also a member of South Central Ontario Fish and Wildlife Association. I live in Cannington, which is down southeast corner of Lake Simcoe. And my question for you, Dr. Lester, as a research scientist, when are you going to tell the Ministry of Natural Resources that to stop the uh, water body from having zero fish, you're going to tell Ministry of Natural Resources there must be an entire um, I've, sorry, I've lost the word. A moratorium on using gill nets east of the highway bridge on the French River and into that lake water body. When are you going to tell them it is time for a moratorium on gill nets? From the commercial fishery? I don't care who uses them. There should be no gill nets before we have zero fish. I mean, the, the basis of this program, is what I can say, is to be able to truly document what the impacts of the stresses are on the system. And I have to admit, that from a, a, a design perspective, it's about providing that type of information so one understands if one has a big issue or not. Um, the solutions are much more complex, I understand. 
I understand that. We're just saying that the Ministry of Natural Resources, again, last yesterday it was reinforced that you're staying with science-based, and you as a scientist uh, always asking when you're going to put your hand up and say, this is a, a crisis. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Felix Barbetti from Font Hill, uh, Zone J, Southwestern Ontario. Hi, Nigel. <laughs> the, uh, Neil asked my question about big river, partitioned rivers. And in Zone J, 24,500 members, we have very little input. Um, we're fortunate in the Grand River to have a, almost a 20-year process through the implementation committee. and the to and fro with the conservation authorities, MNR, and so on. And there's some good work uh, being influenced from FMZ-19 and the lake unit. In the Thames River, we're devoid of meaningful input from stakeholders into the management of that one. So I would very much like to encourage the uh, progression with big river ecology, even though Jack has left. <laughs> And uh, the importance of having a voice with regards to coastal wetlands, um, getting rid of some of the, the most damaging partitions that don't block invasive species, and uh, perhaps even following some of the modeling that's gone on in the states where they've been very successful in that regard. So I'd like to leave you with that and also with the hope that uh, assessment continues to be a strong and robust component of uh, biology as we go from administration to administration. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Bill. Brian Shepard, uh, Port Hope. Um, a question for you is, as uh, you being a scientist and all, uh, pertaining to the walleye, um, a lot of the board of directors here know uh, the lake that I'm uh, referring to is the Lac Sewell. Uh, I hunt or I hunt up there, and I also uh, do a lot of fishing up there. And uh, any day of the week, uh, there's nothing to go out uh, in whatever time of day. During daylight hours, you can catch uh, hundreds of walleye. Why would it be when it comes to as the sun goes down, and walleye being a low light species of fish? you can't catch any. They're just, you could try and try and try. Uh, is there, and, the, and the water is tea stained <clears throat> all the time, so excuse me. This is, a, this is a really low psyche lake, is it not? I, Pardon it's me? A, it's a heavily stained lake. That I, it is, so you're yes it is. About. Yeah. Yes it is, but I, so just you're wonder, fishing? I just wonder why you can, you can get them all day. Yeah. And then at come nighttime, it's, it's impossible. Well, the, the guy who taught me most of what I understood about water clarity in this is one of our former scientists, Dick Ryder. And Dick Ryder basically uh, pointed out, well, and a lot of it based on, on observational stuff, if you, the actual chances of catching them uh, in, in the shoulder periods of the day are higher in the clearer lakes because it's the high water clarity which inhibits the feeding during the middle of the day. So possibly when you've got these, and, and, and basically the argument was that when you have this low Secchi type system, these fish can basically feed all day long. They're not inhibited by the light. So it's, it's possible that it, because of the light, uh, high light, that this sort of sustain, this spreads the fishing out over the day. Okay. Okay. All right, thanks very much. Okay, thank you. So again, I'd just like to, uh, to thank uh, Dr. Lester for such an informative, informative presentation and also uh, taking some, some hard questions on issues that are really important to us um, from a science perspective, uh, even though some of them may uh, do more with policy and, and some other issues, uh, as well as uh, Brian trying to get some fishing tips for Lac Sewell. So we, we, we appreciate your patience, patience and if everyone could uh, join me in thanking Dr. Lester. <laughs>